systems group. Um, essentially, my research has over the years focused on embedded software, system software, uh, architecture, um, high performance computing. And, and more recently, I've been working quite a bit on uh, deep learning acceleration and, and sort of um, building compilers to, to be able to map um, neural networks and CNNs onto uh, specialized hardware, including FPGA <laughs> and, and other things. So uh, I was told that this is mostly a Q&A session and I'm gonna keep my remarks very short. Um, I'm just going to basically welcome you one more time, congratulate you for having made it to this point. I think this is an important turning point in your career. And, um, and the only sort of, I was asked to also maybe give you a little bit of, of, of advice. So I'll share with you what I tell my students when they first join, which is, um, you know, as PhD students, I think uh, when you start your, your studies, you will, um, your time will be kind of, um, many things will compete for your time. You will be taking courses, doing course projects, you will be TAing, um, you will be socializing with your friends and, and enjoying some of the uh, things around Orange County and the beaches. Um, but what I would ask you to make sure uh, to keep in mind is to make sure that every day you make a little bit of progress on your research, because ultimately it's all about defending a thesis. And um, while all of those other activities might seem uh, important, I think nothing's as important as making some, some good progress on your research and pushing that research ball a little bit forward. So just make sure that every day you end the day having made some, you know, some kind of contribution to your research, having read a paper, having, having maybe, um, you know, um, written some code on, or done some experiments uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, other than that, I think there's a whole lot of questions you might have. I, I have my chat window open and um, I don't know what format we will be using. If you just come online and ask your questions or type it in the chat window, I'll try to answer, take turn and Vijay and Nick can also contribute as well, of course. Hey, yeah, BJ. Yeah, okay. So um, everybody has switched off their camera from the student side. I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. Uh, I, for one, like to see people smile when I'm cracking a joke. So uh, this is no good. <laughs> okay. And, 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 you know, it's not uh, like, you know, we would have had everything in person and... Uh, you know, we are, we are robbed of that opportunity. So at least uh, let's see each other for uh, the few minutes that we can. So uh, yeah, my name is Vijay Vasarani and uh, I came here, this is my fourth year here. So I was in Georgia Tech uh, before this for an entire 22 years. I, when I went there, I thought I would be there for a year and then I stayed 20, 21 more years and I wish I had stayed one year and come here <laughs> because this place is, uh, is a, a different level of uh, beautiful uh, work-wise, living-wise, people-wise, everything-wise, weather-wise, uh, everything-wise. So, I, I really think this is a this is a fabulous place. Um, I uh, and and Tony was talking about research. Uh, this is a very serious research university. Um, uh, I, I I I had questions about that. When I came and I, and I so honestly, just to reveal it, I came on leave because I wasn't sure what I was getting into. Uh, because, and, and the reason for that is that Irvine, you see Irvine is very, very new. You have to understand that. It was the very first students were produced, I don't know, in 65 or 66, a class of 13 or something. And, and the first bricks were laid in, in that in 65. And if you look at some other university like Harvard, they are 400 years old, okay. So we have accomplished a huge amount in a very short time, and we are on a very steep slope up. Um, and all these uh, uh, various uh, markers, uh, the rankings and so on are lagging indicators, completely lagging. That's what I would say to you folks. Um, so this is a, a very serious place. Uh, and at the same time, very personable place, very 
very uh, friendly place um, because you know this is California. We are next to the beach. We are in good weather. There's nothing. There's no reason to fight with each other and uh, or have any. So you know this is a beautiful place. So and 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 you can spend all your um, all or every single neuron of yours uh, either having a good time or 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 working. And probably if I see what Tony is trying to say, tell you is uh, you should put working before having a good time. Right, Tony? Sure, yes. <laughs> but definitely yeah. have some good time as well, because I think that that, okay, you, that you don't have your time, mind you're not and work. Uh, I, I make sure I, I, every day I have a time reserved for good time. Otherwise, I cannot work the next day. So, so and, and, the, and the good thing about uh, Erwine is that uh, when you are really, really, really up against the wall and, and, and completely exhausted, in 10 minutes, you can be on the beach and uh, spend a few hours there. And the next day you are fresh as a, as a lemon, if I may say so. <laughs> uh, for, for, uh, from uh, Georgia Tech, I, I, when I was really, really tired after a month, maybe I would take a, a flight out uh, to, to Miami Beach and spend uh, two or three days there. And then only I would come back uh, and be able to work. But here, you know, I can take a 10 minute drive to Newport Beach and it's the best beach in the US. There are better beaches in Greece and other places, but in the US, I haven't seen a better beach than uh, Newport Beach. So if you guys, uh, if we were in session, we would have had a, 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 a ride in uh, Newport Bay in Duffy boats and, <laughs> you know, all those fun things and, and, and a cookout on the beach and you would have seen what a wonderful place this is. But okay, the wonderful place is just, just to enable you to work hard or harder. Okay, the hard work is uh, really, you know, the, the, the faculty here is, is uh, enormously good and becoming better and better at a very, very steep rate. If you look at the young faculty, they are all awesome completely. I, I just um, saw some evaluations, outside letters for young faculty going through tenure process. And I'm stunned, you know, I, I didn't really know that we had hired such, I mean, they were hired before my time, but, but they are really, really the top, top of the top. Um, um, so ML theory, um, AI uh, systems, a, a, every, everything. It's, it's really, 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 really good. Um, what else is there to say? Nothing more. You, you, if, you, if you have any doubts about the research uh, uh, atmosphere or something, ask our students. You can go to our web pages, get uh, email uh, addresses for our students, ask them without even getting permission to ask them because you should just be free to find out more about this place. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's what I would say. But uh, yeah. if you have any questions, uh, I think uh, Nick was going to be a, a few minutes late. So, so but, but if you have any questions, I, uh, uh, in the meantime, the, the three of us or four of us, whoever we are, will be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Vijay and Tony. And uh, uh, Nikki will be a little bit late for this. And uh, so I see the pre- oh, uh, Sorry, uh, I just want to say, if you, if you want me to say what our ranking should be, I think we would definitely be in the top 20, probably in the top 15. Whatever it is, 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 is false, it's wrong. And it, it always takes time for those measures to correct themselves because I can see so many places who are in the top 10 who should be slipping out now because they have lost so many good people. Uh, so, and, 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 and their whole, whole program has gone down, but all these uh, indicators are very lagging. So do not pay attention to them. It's talk to your, the students here, to the faculty here, see the research going on, look at the place and, and, and then make your decision because I know everybody here should have options because we don't, don't get people who don't have options here. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's great, Lee Jane. And uh, uh, I think uh, let's go to some of the questions. And uh, I see one question that students are very like uh, caring about is uh, usually how long it will take for them to get a, like, a, a degree for toward the PhD degree. Can Tony and Lee Jane introduce some of your- So I, uh, Nick is here. So maybe he should uh, introduce himself first. Uh, Nick, Nick, Nick is here. Nick. Nick hi, here. hi everyone. Sorry, I, I just uh, got out of a dental appointment, so I may be sounding funny. One side of my mouth is a little uh, sore. 
But uh, welcome everyone. I'm Nick Dutt. I'm with the computer science department uh, as a faculty. My er research areas are fairly broad. I work in electronic design automation, in um, uh, healthcare IoT, neuromorphic computing, and a bunch of other stuff. So. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Nikki. And uh, so let's go back to the first question that like many students asked like how many years it will take toward the PhD degree in general in the department? Who wanna go first? I don't know. I think Tony would know the average, but sure. Uh, I, what I tell students is um, plan on five years nominal. And then um, there, there are a number of things that go into that, that question. One is if, if you come already with a master's degree, you will uh, certainly avoid taking a, a lot of courses and that, that will accelerate things a little bit. Um, some students take longer than five years. I think I've seen some take as long as eight years, but that's, not, that's very uncommon. I think the average is right around five years. Um, and I, I've also seen students finish in four years. To a large extent, it depends on how successful you are as a, as a PhD student and how much progress you make on your, on your thesis and how quickly, but um, five would be the, the nominal number. I see, I see. And, and uh, you might want to add any extra time for, uh, for whatever time they spend on the beach, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But, but I would say, look, I. I don't think it's very helpful to, to think of this as doing time, right? It's not, this is not a time bound problem. It's, um, it, it's, it's a chapter of your life. You have to make the best of it. You have to, to think of it as, as you know, a fun part of your career. And um, it, it would be painful if, if every day you're kind of marking things on the wall in terms of how many days you've been here and how much longer you have to go. I think you really should count progress in terms of um, you know, how many papers you're publishing, how many conferences you're attending, how many talks you're giving, how, you know, what, what's your productivity and what, what uh, contacts you're making, what net, uh, how, how your network is growing, how many internships you've done, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a much better measure of gauge of kind of progress. Um, so the numbers I gave you are, are more of, of sort of just only as statistical interest. I don't think they should impact your day-to-day -day life. Um, yeah, so I, I just I'd add to Tony's uh, comment that every every student is a one-off, uh, and and different to students uh, take different amounts of time. Uh, many many factors like your luck, uh, whether you were working on uh, something for three years and found out that it was done twenty years ago, and so the whole thing goes down the tubes. I mean, there are th all kinds of things like that that happen. So let me just give you some uh, very extreme cases from my uh, my, my own students. So there was a time when I spent five years uh, as a faculty member at IIT Delhi. I, I, I'm a theory person, I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned it. So while I was there for five years, I, I had a PhD student there, Naveen Garg, who first did his undergrad thesis with me and went straight into his PhD. And he finished in, in IIT Delhi doing top-notch work, which is still in, uh, you know, in, being cited. He's in the Indian National Science Academy and guess how many years he took at IIT Delhi, not sitting in the middle of uh, an, a, a MIT or, or Berkeley, but at IIT Delhi, out, out in, 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 in nowhere, doing a great thesis that is still quoted all over the place. And any guess? Three. Okay. And uh, from after his PhD, uh, so yeah, I mean, I mean, he 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 really flourished like uh, amazing in amounts. So so uh, he he actually even had a, 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 an admission at Berkeley, but he decided to stay on because he wanted to be close to his parents, and he saw me around. Nice. So uh, on the other hand, uh, I've had students in US who have taken six years. So so what is there? What can one say about the exact time? There, there's not. I mean, every, every case is a one-off. Okay. All right. The second question is, uh, is there a lab rotation policy in the CS department? And uh, can we change the devices in case things don't go well? That's one of the top questions the students have. 
So maybe I can take the second part of the question. If I understood it right, the question was, can, can students change advisors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I think at the end of the day, you really need to uh, work with, with the professor or faculty that um, where there's some chemistry and, and you're able to actually you know, achieve uh, your, your, your goals of writing a thesis. It does happen. And I, you know, I was associate dean before, um, you know, for five years um, before I became vice chair, which is my, my current sort of administrative role. And um, there were a number of PhD students that for one reason or another had to change their, their advisor. It's of course, um, you know, there's a cost to be paid. Sometimes changing an advisor will, will cost you a little bit of extra time to graduate, um, but it does happen. And, um, you know, there is really um, no, um, you know, it's it's part of, I guess, this this business that that you really need to find somebody to work with that you're comfortable with. There's some chemistry, and you're able to um, kind of together achieve your research goals. I can I can add to that. I think uh, you know it depends on. Um... We have a very diverse pool, I'm sure, of uh, admitted PhDs. Some already have done research and know exactly what they want to do. And uh, even in those instances, they may decide that, you know, uh, what they thought they wanted to do after they arrive uh, can change. And there's quite a few who are maybe uh, fresh out of school or have done some, but not quite sure what they want to do. And obviously it's your decision in terms of what you want to do. Uh, the initial affiliation that is given to you is in some sense, an academic affiliation uh, in terms of uh, your advisor is an academic advisor. And in some cases that bond may be strengthened if you already have some ongoing research or perhaps uh, you have interests that are closely aligned. And so every student who comes in is, is free to um, switch advisors. Um, you know, just keep in mind, like Tony said, uh, you know, if you've been in the program for a while, then and, and you're switching it, there's probably some issues in terms of uh, the amount of time that you need to spend or what it needs in terms of reorienting. Or it could be sort of in the same, you could be still working on the same topic and perhaps uh, the advisor that you have didn't work out for whatever reason. And it's perfectly fine to do that. Um, and uh, that, that's something that, that does happen. And uh, it's um, something that you can keep in mind. As for the second part about rotation, we don't have an explicit, I don't believe we have an explicit mechanism for uh, rotating students, unlike, unlike uh, say bio-sci or some other natural sciences where students come in and uh, you know, they rotate through one quarter each lab or something like that. However, I believe some groups are trying to do something like that. Uh, so you might want to check if um, the, you know, sort of the area that uh, you're affiliated with initially does that and you might do that. But you could also try that yourself. If you're interested, you might want to attend uh, the lab seminars of uh, Professor X for one quarter and then Professor Y for a second quarter, if you don't really have an idea, if that's something that, uh, you know, might stimulate research interest. But that's just my opinion. Uh, can I add a little bit to this? So, so here's an example of uh, something that may interest you. So last fall, uh, uh, I got a student from Caltech. He, was, uh, he did an amazing thesis, uh, undergrad thesis with Leonard Schulman. The thesis is also on his website. If you go to my website, you'll see his, his name is Will Overman. And uh, he wanted to do uh, uh, matching markets. Uh, he met me at a talk that I gave at Caltech and uh, kept in touch and then uh, applied and came here. And this January, uh, Yanis Panayas, who's right here, he's one of the faculty's uh, young, fac uh, uh, young faculty member helping with this. He came aboard, he has done uh, work in uh, uh, ML from a theory perspective, from an algorithms perspective. And uh, Will said, hey, I, I also want to do this. I said, of course, contact him. And in fact, in fact, sorry, in fact, he contacted Yanis uh, while Yanis was still in Singapore. He couldn't come in last fall because of uh, pandemic and visa issues and, and, and the whole mess. So he was talking to uh, Yanis uh, on, on Zoom in the fall and Yanis came in, in, in January and he's doing a joint thesis. So it is as simple as that. 
uh, there are no hard walls or boundaries you do whatever you want and and people are uh, extremely accommodating there are no turf wars or you know you cannot work with he, uh, this person and I cannot work. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there are places that have have this. I, I have seen those, and they, they can be extremely debilitating. N none of that exists here, fortunately. It's a very, very clean atmosphere. So thank you for your suggestions. So the next question is: uh, Some students asked, they see some existing students. They have co-advisors, and how to look for this joint super supervise the uh, learning experience in our department. I think I presented one example of that already. So. <laughs> okay, <Maybe>. that's great. <laughs> I, I think it happens organically oftentimes. Sometimes it's it's initiated by, by the student. Uh, maybe you take some professor's course and, and you get really excited about some topic and you figure out a way to, to maybe collaborate or combine different research ideas. Sometimes it, it's sort of initiated by faculty who already have a joint grant or project together and, and it just makes a lot of logical sense to co-advise. Uh, so it's it's sort of a very flexible organic process and when it happens, I think you, you get that amplification effect because you get you sort of the productivity sometimes is, is better and, and you just learn more. So it, it's a good thing. I think there is no rules or laws against it and, and if it happens, uh, go for it, right? And we do want to encourage you to collaborate, not just with kind of have multiple uh, co-advisors, but also I would say try to also collaborate a lot with, with other students um, in your group or maybe even in, in other groups within the school. Thank you for the suggestions. And the next question is about the TA. Uh, how do we know which subjects we will be TA for? And uh, for how many years do we have to do it before getting an RA? Maybe I can answer the first part because it's a bit administrative. And, and as, as a vice chair, I kind of work closely with our staff, Shole and Holly, who, who do the TA assignment. So uh, they have a process in place. They make you fill out an application. So you apply to become a TA. And as part of the application, you, you kind of uh, state or list your areas of expertise or the, the things you would be comfortable TAing. And, and Shola and Holly would take that into account uh, in sort of assigning you a TA ship. If they have to assign you, um, and sometimes faculty ask for certain TAs. So for example, I oftentimes, the course I teach them in systems course, I would ask Shole to, to assign certain students that I know know that that topic very well and can be very effective. So sometimes it happens that way. But but ultimately, you know, we we, we do want to make sure that you are able to, to TA, be a, be a good effective TA for the courses you're being assigned. And there's some effort that goes into that. Um, the, you know, the second part of the question is a little bit more complicated in terms of how many years you have to TA before you become an RA. I think that that depends heavily on on how well are you embedded into a, a research project, and and if you're sort of if you if you figured it all out and you have a clear direction and you're making good progress, I think faculty would be very motivated to to fund you as an RA, so you're not distracted and you can focus on that. Uh, usually at the beginning of of your studies, you you don't you're not necessarily well grounded in research, so you might spend more time TAing, and then of course there's a funding aspect too, too in terms of research funding availability uh, and so on. So it, it varies, but um, you know, there are certain things you can do to, to get on an RA track more uh, sort of uh, quickly. And that's by basically um, increasing your research productivity. I'll, I'll let Nick and, and maybe Vijay add to that um, as you have more students in that role. No, I think, I think you're right. It's an organic process and uh... Sometimes you sit in on somebody's course and uh, and you know a project starts and uh, you say hey, I, I I want to have joint advisor so, so once uh, I was at Georgia Tech uh, and from Sharif came a student uh, named uh, Amin Saberi I don't know if anybody know of this name Amin Saberi no so. He was, uh, of course, work, wanted to work on uh, algorithms, and he worked with me. And then, uh, 
he saw that uh, my, my wife, Milena Mihail, who was also faculty there and is faculty here, she was working on complex uh, networks and he started working on with her and we both became joint advisors. And uh, because he did two things uh, and both very well, he ended up uh, with a faculty position at Stanford and is now full professor at Stanford. So I just want to add to what uh, Tony and Vijay said. Um, uh, you know, in addition to what uh, Tony mentioned, um, obviously courses are one opportunity. Um, maybe the faculty groups may have um, um, opportunities where there may be, for example, an RA opening for working on a funded project, which is at the intersection of area A and B. Um, but in my group, for instance, I have a, a large number of co-advised students. Um, and it comes because of the nature of some of the research I'm doing, which is uh, more interdisciplinary. And so I think that lends itself to requiring um, the expertise of um, advisors from these various domains. So it could happen within CS as well. So depending on you know, the interest that you have, that might naturally lead into a need to have someone be a co-advisor co because they may provide that domain knowledge of that that specific instance. So that's one example. But it could also happen within um, an area. It might be that, uh, you know, uh, there's a group of, it might come organically through uh, research seminars. Maybe you're sitting in a research seminar or in a class, and that leads into discussions that say you work on a problem, and then, uh, you know, that naturally leads into code value. So I think there are many instances of that. Um, de depends a lot on the topics that you're working on. And if the faculty are open to doing that, some it's also very personal, right? Some, some uh, people like to work by themselves. Some people are a lot more collaborative. And so that's something that you might want to gauge and you'll figure it out. And also for you, uh, because you know, having two advisors also means trying to navigate uh, you know, who is really your academic advisor. So it's probably important to, to have a one key academic advisor and, and research co-advisors, because then uh, that academic advisor can guide you in terms of, uh, you know, uh, both all the logistics of how you navigate the system of courses to take, et cetera, et cetera. And then with respect to research, yeah, I think uh, in some sense, the entire research committee of your thesis committee could be co-advisors, depending on how active they are in providing input. It might be your, your key advisor, it may be co-advisors, maybe multiple, depending on the context. Thank you very much for your comments. And the next question is, uh, how do we choose the graduate uh, committee? Anyone wanna? Yeah, I think uh, that follows on the discussion that we just had. I think I, and I, I'm sure the other faculty would, would uh, give their two cents as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, typically you have you know, either an advisor or, or maybe a set of co-advisors. And so they naturally would be the core of your committee. And uh, depending on uh, you know, the uh, department you're in and the program you're in, uh, typically you're, you have to go through two phases as you know, there's the candidacy exam where you have to demonstrate that you have the ability and skills to uh, perform independent research. And at that point, you're duly designated a PhD candidate. And then for your final PhD, you need a committee of three. So for the candidacy exam, it's a group of five. Uh, and Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there has to be one external member, one member who's not from your uh, program, not, not affiliated with computer science. And then the four others are, you know, some uh, people that hopefully are uh, folks who might give you some insight. So you might uh, work with your advisors to find uh, committee members, or you might have chance to pawn them by taking classes or listening to seminars or lectures. Um, in, in days when uh, we were physically going to the building, we might chance upon them in corridor conversations. You know, you, so so there, there are many different instances where you can find ways to um, find the right group of your committee members. And it kind of happens when the time comes, it just happens naturally. I mean, I, I, in my 20 years, I've never seen a student struggle to find a, a committee of four plus one for candidacy and then three final members for, for you know, it's, it's just the nature of, of the interactions you will have in the department. When you're ready for the exams, you will know very well who might be good, good people to include in your committee. 
and you work with your advisor to sort of make a final selection. And there's a, a small twist to that, which I'm sure Vijay will have many insights on this as well. Um, you know, it also depends on what your career goals are. If you're going into academia, then the choice of your committee is extremely important because uh, they will give you guidance, they will write letters for you. So there's also perhaps some strategy, if you will, in terms of picking the right members, depending on your career goals. Uh, so that's just uh, something else that might uh, factor into your uh, decision in terms of who to ask to serve on your committee. But at the end of the day, it's really your decision because you're the PhD candidate and you're trying to figure out who should be on your committee right? with the advice of your uh, faculty mentors. So I just want to say that uh, uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, the hardest part of it all of your PhD was how to get these five people at the same time in the same <laughs> <laughs> okay, because everybody was doing, but here uh, everybody is living right next to the department, and uh, you can easily find that. So, so your hardest problem is already solved. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I, th I think you should, you should be asking more interesting questions, like what? How do we get to the beach from here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. Don't ask about committees and all that. That that's an obviousity. It will happen. Uh... Let me see. Let me try to find some interesting questions. Well, the next question might be, well, how to choose courses based on tracks and, and the specializations. I'm, I'm trying very hard to pick an <laughs> interesting question, Vijay. I promise you, I, I will. <laughs> yeah, the courses based on tracks and specific, specifications. Any, any suggestions? Sure. So I, may, maybe this would also be a good time to, to remind you that if you already have a master's in computer science or computer science and engineering or, or some, um, some um, kind of related major where some of the courses that you require to complete, you've already taken or there's some overlap that you can establish, I, I really encourage you to work with your faculty advisor early on, maybe the first quarter you join and try to kind of see if it makes sense to, to petition to have some of those uh, courses sort of for you to get credit for courses already taken. The reason I say that is really you want to, you, you want to satisfy the course component of your, of your degree and then spend the rest of your time on, on research as quickly as possible. But if, if sort of setting that aside, um, you know, you, there is obviously, we do have some required courses that you have to take and, and, you know, I cannot probably break it down all here in detail, but it's all on our website and maybe offline we can look at it. There is a set of courses, 10 to 12, I believe it would be the total. So if, if you were to maintain full-time um, course um, load for the first year and a half, to two years is, is the, uh, about how long it will take for you to satisfy all the courses, starting from sort of this, uh, the, the very bottom, assuming you only have a bachelor's degree in computer science. If you have master's, hopefully there's much smaller pool of courses you have to take. Uh, and, and the courses do give you some flexibility. There are certain courses you have to take like a theory course and, and, and others. And then in, in other courses, there, there are some electives that you can pick and choose. And also availability of courses in the quarters that you are you are trying to, to complete things factors into your decision of what courses to take. Not every course is offered every quarter at all times. So there's a little bit of planning uh, that you have to do. But my, my, my final advice would be don't try to rush in taking all the courses. Um, you, you kind of want to maintain balance. I think the key here is to maintain balance and you could always um, sign up for independent research um, to maintain your 12 unit load. And that independent research basically is your time that you can dedicate to doing some research. So you wanna keep a good mix of some kind of well-defined textbook type courses and some, some research units to, to make sure that you're also are doing some, some research. Yeah. So one more like related question to this question before we come to the final interesting question. That is, uh, does a master's degree from another country still work for waiving some of the required courses? I think I tried to basically, the first thing I was trying to say is exactly that. If you, 
if I understood the question correctly, if you already have a master's degree, um, there is a, an exercise you have to go through, which is you sort of have to uh, take a look at our course title and description, and maybe even the course um, syllabus from, from a professor who recently taught the course and kind of compare that with, with the same exact information from the courses you already took. So if you already have taken, let's say, let me use my course as an example. I teach a graduate embedded software course. If you already taken a course that substantially covers the material that I cover, you can get credit for that. And it's generally my, my recommendation to students that I advise is that try to get credit for as many of these courses as you can, because you know, I, it's, it's just more efficient and, and we wouldn't wanna waste your time. Um, and your time will be spent better you know, doing research. However, if there are certain areas where you feel like you will benefit from taking those courses again, or, or you may want to get a different perspective, of course, you also have that option. You're, you won't be forced into um, sort of not taking your courses. But this is a very good um, item to discuss with your faculty advisor sort of in the early days when you, you know, in the fall when you begin. I think that's sort of a perfect um, topic for some, some of the initial meetings you will have with your faculty advisors to kind of look at those two sets of courses, the ones you've taken and the ones you have to take and see if there's any overlap. Yeah, so probably the last question is, uh, is it easy or possible to get to the ocean, mountains or LA from Berlin? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe let, 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 me, let me answer let me tell you one thing okay the most difficult thing once you come to Irvine is if you to decide where to take a vacation because because you're on a constant vacation where where else do you want to go up from here there's no better place so so where will you go for a vacation okay anyway uh, that apart but yeah the mountains are there the the, the ocean is there the desert is there Everything is uh, within uh, two, three, four hours of driving. And I can say I ride my bicycle. So around Irvine, there's a ton of trails that, that you can take on a bicycle or even walk. I, I can get to the beach easily on a bicycle. Generally, if you have a car, you can go to the mountain and see snow and then drive to LA and have fun and then go to San Diego, go to you know Disneyland and, and the beach. And there's also some shuttles that run around that, that can take you places around UCI for, for free. Um, a lot of our students kind of try to get a car um, quickly here. I mean, get your license and get a car, cheap car, and that, that will allow you to explore uh, further places. And there's, of course, Uber and other options, but there's also a there's lot- There's one more, there's one more. Yeah. So I don't know, you, you people probably met uh, my student, uh, Thorben Tropst. He was doing the research presentation today earlier. He's a big, he came from Germany um, uh, and he's a big time uh, uh, rolling enthusiast. So skate, skate rollers. <laughs> and he ro skate rolls to uh, uh, like 25 miles to uh, uh, one of the further off beaches uh, every week or twice a week or something. So that, that, that enables him to think deeper on, uh, on, on all the work that we do. By the way, I do have a two o'clock meeting and I apologize. I'm gonna to have to say goodbye, but this, this has been fun. So I'm gonna sort of jump off of the Zoom call, but good luck to all of you and hope to see you soon. Okay. Thank you, Tani. And I guess we're all splitting off into uh, open lab sessions anyway, two o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah two it's an open lab session. Okay. So the last question, like I, I probably can answer that is, uh, they want to talk to some faculties and students who didn't sign up for, for this session. And we, so for faculty, it's always e easy to email them. And we are happy here to chat with our prospective, uh, prospective students. And we have a Slack channel and we have a volunteer group answering all like all kinds of questions. So just feel free to reach out. We are always here to, to help. And thank you, Wei Jay and Yuki. Thank you so much for your, like, sharing your experience and the next session is an open lab session that is separated by different research areas and uh, we have that information in our one-stop shop google google doc so please join in whichever like research area open lab you would like to to see and uh, let us know if you have some further questions 
So thank you so much. And uh, we sincerely look forward to see everyone later this year here. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.